I remember walking through like an old dried valley in this area and you know we were looking for Cedar Zem Dun and just thinking like this is not what anyone does or nobody tries to keep them like this. Uh, at the time I think I knew of a couple of people who were doing quite well with them and they were just keeping them in a tub but like a set kind of mid 20 centigrade um, range whereas I, I remember when I got a group I had them in a really I can't remember how big but it was a big enclosure and I just used like a couple of halogens to really heat up one corner and they would bask in it but then they could get away so they weren't kind of dehydrating and, and cooking all the time mm-hmm. um, and it's the same in, the, in those areas you know you find frogs um, like torrent frogs which you would never provide with really hot temperatures in the wild Welcome back to another episode of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Ben Owens, who is a PhD student out of the UK, and he's also the founder and director of Captive and Field Herpetology. In this episode, honestly, we discuss so much, it's hard to even explain what we talked about. And even though it's only an 80 or 90 minute episode, it almost felt longer than that in a good way, not in a bad way at all, because we covered so many different things. It's amazing how much we packed into this 80 or 90 minutes. Of course, we talk about captive and field herpetology, which is the business that Ben has created, which is really aimed at bridging the gap between captive reptile keeping and the wild, which I know everybody listening to this podcast is super eager to learn about. So we discuss how he came up with that, how he has folded in a really interesting peer-reviewed journal into that system that we can all access and learn from and even contribute to if you like. We discuss what he's learned from the field, especially some misconceptions with temperature and humidity and observation bias. That's another thing that I think we've, in, especially in this podcast, I've leaned on a lot talking about when you see these animals in the wild, how much you can pull from those experiences. But Ben brings up some really great, great points about how dangerous that can be as far as, you know, you see one animal one time, you know, how dangerous it can be basing your entire husbandry based off of that one experience. So we talk about that. We talk about snake bite. Ben does a ton of work in India helping and attempting to help reduce the incidence of snake bite. And then we talk about the exp- expeditions that he goes on as well. So there really is, a, 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 like, I said a ton of content in this episode and I had a blast chatting with Ben and I know you will all enjoy this episode too. Make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com if you're looking for more information on this episode. Any links and whatnot mentioned throughout the episode I typically try to include there. Sometimes I forget and sometimes a few of you are really good about typing in the comments on YouTube when I do not add a link into the show notes. So that is super helpful. So if you find something throughout the episode that is not included in the show notes and you think should be, just put it in the YouTube comments and I'll make sure to go back and include it there. If you would like to buy an Animals at Home t-shirt or sweater, you can do that at animalsathome.ca slash shop. When you do make a purchase, $5 is automatically donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. If you would like to help support the podcast financially. You can do that for as little as $3 a month at patreon.com slash animals at home. All of that really, really does help. It goes towards helping support the podcast financially, paying for the editing, paying for the server space. So any of that help is greatly appreciated. And finally, thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description or the show notes, or just head to animalsathome.ca slash CRH. That will take you right to their website. If you do make a purchase, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And I think that is all I have to say. Let's jump into the episode. Enjoy. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, no problem at all. It's, uh, I'm glad to be here. It'll be good. It'll be really good. Yeah, I'm very excited to chat with you. You're somebody who has experience boots on the ground You know, in, in these areas where I think many people just don't have the opportunity to go or, or have. And so I, I cannot wait to get into that stuff because I think so many keepers want to hear from people who have experience with these animals in the wild. And there's so much we can learn. But let's start with how you got into this. How, how did you originally, have you always been a nature lover or how did that path go along for you? Yeah. Um, I don't know whether it's just like in the genes for some people. I was I was one of those kids where like every rock needed to be flipped. Um every bush needed to be crawled into and everything like that. Like where I walk around with my dad when I was younger and, you know, it was a huge rock on the side. So you'd have to lift that. I'm sure I kept him fit. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think I was just always obsessed with it, you know, watching documentaries, David Attenborough. Um, I think when I was a kid, I wasn't reading kids books. I was like buying the old David Attenborough 
books and, <laughs> and yeah, whatnot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just all just always always been like that. Um, did, when did reptiles get folded in? Or were they always part of it as well? Obviously, you're flipping rocks. You're probably finding some frogs and snakes and whatnot. Yeah, like we we don't get much in uh, in Wales. Mm-hmm. You know, there's all, the island I live on. You know, we have adders and that's it. Um, I I guess yeah, they were always kind of part of the mix. Um, I had like a really broad interest when I was younger, and I actually got into keeping birds before anything. Because my uncle really loves birds, so he kind of used me and my sister as the young kids as an excuse to get the aviary going. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had a couple of aviaries. And then from there, it was fish. I got really into keeping fish. Like my room was just full of tanks um, from probably about the age of nine or 10. Um, I had a tank for Christmas and like, I still have that. It's empty at the moment, but it's, it's still stored away. But yeah, it was one of those weird ones. My mum has a, like an actual phobia of fish. Wow. Um, yeah. So I really. Even, even fish in a fish tank? Yeah, yeah, she's she's oh, done wow. well now. Um, you know, she she like goes out to the pond and stuff now. But yeah, it's I've met a couple of people afterwards. I always thought it was really weird, but um, it was great when I was younger. I could just run into my bedroom and open the fish tank and hide behind it if I was like in trouble <laughs> or anything. <laughs> yeah, that works out um, well. But yeah, from there, I kind of I used to go to this aquatics shop um, probably like once or twice a week with my grandparents, and I just hassle the woman that owned it i was just there for hours and end, just chatting away and then you know, I, just, I just had a phone call maybe when i was probably about 13 years old um to say that they'd gotten rid of someone they needed somebody to fill in and i just kind of started weekend work there it was like day one left of the till by myself no idea what to do praying no customers would come in <laughs> yeah um and then yeah it was i think a couple, maybe a year or two of working there the owner got a problem milk snake in and I didn't, in, like at the beginning, I didn't really think too much of it. And it kept escaping. I think I escaped three or four times. And then it was just one day. I was like, that's actually a really cool animal. Um, so then it was, you know, weeks of me begging my parents to, to get it, which I eventually did. Um, and then I just had like, yeah, the odd thing, like be a dragon, um, got into spiders. And it was mainly because the shop was getting these things in. Mm-hmm. Um and then when I got to uni, I met a guy who was really into his Asian agamas. Um, and then we learned about, you know, like the ham show in Germany and things and mm. all these other crazy um, roots or the crazy access you have to all these kind of uncommon species. And that's well, where it, like, it's, it really hit. It, it's funny how there's that mental shift sometimes where you could be exposed to an animal for a, a long period of time and not think anything of it. And then suddenly something changes. Like, I, mean, I think we've all done that, especially in the reptile hobby, where you could see people sharing photos of a certain species and you just like flip through it on Instagram, don't even care about it. And then for some reason, something will shift, whether you hear somebody talking about it passionately or you see a really nice image or a video. And then suddenly you just become amazed at that species and you think, wow, I, I want to keep that myself. I, I think everybody's had that experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I had it a few years ago with um, Japanese rat snakes. I mm. kind of never thought too much about them. You know, they're kind of this uniform color, just another big colubrid. And then I was gifted one from a zoo, um, like a really old animal. And I was like, this is actually very, very cool. Um, and I, you know, I think eventually I'll probably get a few more. But um, yeah, that was kind of one of those things that I just brushed off or just I wouldn't yeah. stop to look at. And now that we have one, it's like, Oh, actually, yeah, I really, I really undervalued, uh, undervalued you. <laughs> yeah, it is the same with me with with uh, North American colubrids. I always thought I would never keep them. I'm not, I don't enjoy them. And then for whatever reason, I found them so amazing in the last year or so. And I almost wish that's what I started with because it would be so much mm-hmm. easier to, you know, I can source stuff from outside to make it look more naturalistic and whatnot. And yeah, all of a sudden there's these beautiful, the beautiful or the beauty of the animals, like, you know, jumping out on the page to me when before it wasn't. So it's, it's, it's kind of cool. It sort of shows you that, you know, there is a deep respect to those animals at all times. It's just sometimes that you're not aware of it at first. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have it like now recently as well. It's I never used to think too much of um, Lanthanotus, the, mm. the earless monitors. Like I thought we thought they were quite cool and stuff. I thought I probably won't get into keeping them. And it was just a few weeks ago. I kind of went down the rabbit hole of reading about them and thinking, you know, I actually do fancy a go with those and i don't know whether it's because they're so hard to get in the uk now mm-hmm. um well that's, that, you know, i think they're so they're super hard to get in the uk um they might not be 
maybe it's one of those things where like I can't have it, so I want it. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's a little bit of that in all of us. Um, but yeah, it, it does seem to happen quite quite frequently these days. So what do you have right now in your just personal collection? Before we started recording, you said you were up at like 3 a.m. looking after the animals. I don't know, were those your personal animals or is that a different collection? Yeah, yeah. So it kind of it's kind of like a mix, I guess. Um, so we have like the the main animal room, I guess, where everything's kept. And it's a mix of like what I use for the, the workshops and stuff we do, but I also kind of intermixes with my personal collection. Um, and then we have a, like a separate tortoise house, which we built maybe about 18 months ago. Um, so that's sulcates and leopards at the moment. Um, which is just cause you know, needed like a paddock essentially for the, right. the sulcates. She was getting big. Um, so we, we built a, I can't remember how big it is now. It's a pretty big room, but we sunk it into the ground by three feet. Um, cause I was looking at the greenhouse designs in the Arizona deserts where they can like keep them really warm or cool by just sinking them into the ground. And right. it made such a difference. I had some flooding issues at the beginning because Wales is really wet. So, you know, I finished it. It was all nice and tidy, ready to set up. And I opened the door one day and it was just like a foot of water in there. Yeah, um, all of a sudden we, we, you found the water table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. We had to kind of do all kinds of landscaping to shift the water around the building and uh, waterproof the insides. Um, and then we recently just kind of dipped into doing outdoor enclosures. Um, so I, we, I've done a Stella Gamma enclosure, which is like, I think it's like a 12 foot, um, a three meter enclosure, which is kind of like a block wall and then like a cold frame on top or like a, with a wooden frame um, with some bed acrylic. So we get, I think I measured about 96% UV transmission oh, wow. through at the moment. Uh, but he's, yeah, we've had the mail in there and he overwintered. Um, and I, really? I got a beta logger in and it got to like minus one. And he's woken up this spring and I've never seen him so healthy. It's a wild caught animal from Israel. And yeah, I was, I was kind of very, keeping a very close eye and ready to pull him in, but I just powered through and. Did he brew in the ground? Did he dig a hole or, or, or under some objects or how did he sleep through the winter? No, I actually, so I, I did set up some kind of like underground chambers, which would stay dry with tubes going down to them and, you know, loads of kind of thick vegetation for him to get into, or there's a massive pile of rocks. Um, but he just kind of stayed out in the open on the edge of the rocks. It was really weird. I was getting really worried, but um, I think it was just stable enough. It was, it was really, really stable enough when we, because we were checking with the, the data logger, you know, there was no sharp spikes in temperature mm-hmm. or anything like that. And yeah, it was absolutely fine. As soon as the, the kind of first real sun hit in spring, like it was just awake and, and ready to go. Yeah, well, that's really cool. cool. I mean, and that's a massive enclosure too. You could never go backwards from that. Yeah, I mean, we used to have them in like, I think it was maybe like a five foot, you know, wooden div, which would be fine. And, you know, most of the time, and I wouldn't really look at one and think, oh, that's not big enough. But um, yeah, I put them in there now. It's like, I, I couldn't put them back inside. It's just, it's it's just too good to see, to see it yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, that's cool. Well, and I have a feeling where that sort of reason for wanting exercise comes from, obviously, with probably a lot of the field work. And I want to talk about that in a second. But before, you you also pursued a reptile-related PhD. Are you still doing your PhD or are you finished now? Yeah, yeah, that's that's been, um, it's kind of steady now. It, it was a roller coaster because it started just before COVID. Mm, of course. Um, so I was initially doing a study on the spatial ecology of Russell's vipers. Um, so we were tracking them in India and the plan was to look at spatial ecology and also like habitat use and how that co- um, kind of ties in with snake bite risk and things. Um, so I was out there for a little bit, but then I got stuck out there when COVID hit. Mm-hmm. I remember we, we were doing some fishing in the evening at one of the like um, lakes that are on the farm where I was staying. And it was 20 to midnight. And we just checked the news and the government had announced an Indian nationwide lockdown from midnight oh my like, god oh, five hours away from the airport but like surely i must be able to get home and then reality sunk like nah i'm not getting home so i was there for a few weeks um and eventually kind of managed to get out on a repat flight which was just a chaotic it was so difficult to get organized and so i guess and your complete focus shifts from phd to just getting back home yeah yeah because yeah, i couldn't go out to do the field work at the time either because i was like the only Westerner in, in that in that area. So as soon as I think 
it didn't happen. But I think if COVID was to get bad whilst I was there, and you know, if anyone um, was to suffer from it, they could look at like me being the reason that COVID reached there, um, right, even though I was exactly. there before that, um, which is understandable. But yeah, that, so like the uni was obviously a bit wary about that, and they wanted me back. Um, and then when I was back, it was just looking unrealistic to do any uh, field work abroad. So the shift moved on to looking at uh, thermal ecology and spatial ecology of the source scale vipers and sidewinders in just outside Dubai. Mm. But that was kind of a short term thing that I was just again just became super unrealistic. And then a project came up with the same team looking at the genomics of adders in the UK. So I, I decided to go for that um, just because we didn't know how long COVID was going to last at the time. Because it was about it was a little over. A, probably about a year ago that I kind of shifted over onto that. And that's kind of grown into a, like a genomic approach to uh, reptiles in the UK now. Mm. But so we're used we're basically using methods that they'd use in ancient DNA. So like mammoths and cave bears. Um, so one of the guys that works with us, he's kind of developed all these crazy genomic methods for analyzing cave bear DNA. So it basically allows us to use really low sample numbers. You know, we can tell all kinds of things about a population from one or two samples. Um, and you just do a low coverage genome, so you just get loads of information, which is enough to test things like heterozygosity and relatedness between populations. Um, so we're just trying to develop those methods, really. Um, we've just recently done a small study on sand lizards in Wales to assess the ancestry of some of the populations, because they're kind of planted in various places in North Wales and South Wales, um, unofficially, I guess. Mm -hmm. They're kind of in the right habitat, but they weren't there previously. And then they did appear a few years ago. So we're kind of figuring out where they're from, are they native and stuff. Um, and is have you discovered an answer to that question yet? Or is that still being compiled? Um, yeah, yeah. So we, we've still got a few more to do. Um, we did figure out that it's, you know, they are what they should be. And we don't have to worry about you know, what happens if they weren't, if they were like European subspecies or anything like that, are they, if they were captive animals? Um, Cause I think that would raise a whole load of questions. Mm. Um, but yeah, we, so we still kind of have a little bit more work to do just to increase the populations we're analyzing and stuff. Um, Cause it's, it's always the case using, using old samples. It's the quality can be rubbish. You, you think it's good when you test it in the lab and then you send it off and the sequencing company, I'll just say, I'll oh, look, it failed library control. Um, so you kind of need to go and, and redo this. And then it's a whole, you know, few more weeks of getting more samples ready or um, finding some decent ones. Right. But, uh, but yeah, we're pretty confident, you know, there's, we're not going to have to go through any of those nightmares of having to deal with what do we do? Because there's, there's no set rule. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty fascinating. And I think for, for those of us who haven't done a PhD, it's just interesting to hear starting a project and hoping that you can do that your phd work on that one and having to switch how, how stressful is that because obviously there's funding involved with putting you into di different locations and trying to find grants i'm sure to do this research and then to have to constantly switch it were you stressed out because you're sort of it, it's not really a ticking time it's sort of a is there a timeline where you need to be finished by or for you just mentally you want to be done yeah um i was quite lucky because i'm doing it part-time um which is good at this stage because I essentially it'll be, it'll be a lot more stressful at the end because I'll have less time, I think, to write my thesis because it kind of squashes into two years like it normally would anyway. Mm. Um, I was just glad it happened at the beginning. If it had happened like three years in, I think oh. I could have, you know, I'd have had data there that I was kind of stuck with and then having to find more and it wouldn't maybe flow nicely. Um, it was stressful. Like it was very stressful because I didn't really know what was going to happen. And I was at the point of deferring just before the other project became a thing. I, I was very close to saying, look, I don't think I should do anything for now because even though I'm right at the beginning of this timeline, it's still ticking away. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of came at the perfect time. So we just had a little bit of time last year to actually do some sampling Um so I didn't have to kind of wait until this field season, you know, we're into our second field season now, which is just crazy to think that we've had this year of work and all the stresses were happening beforehand, which are distant memory now. Um, yeah. It certainly made time go quickly. It didn't feel like it at the time, but thinking back now, it's made it go very, very quickly. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's pretty fascinating. So why don't we talk a little bit about 
your other project, the the Captive and Field Herpetology. So why don't you tell me, tell me how that started? What motivated you to start that? Um, yeah, it was a bit of a random one, really. Um, it was, so I was, I'd done a little bit of traveling um, in 2015. So I'd gone on a couple of herp tours in like Guatemala, I'd been to Arizona with the uni. So I'd, I'd kind of dipped my feet into, into herp field work. And I was just at the beginning of a long backpacking trip. So I was traveling in India and I was going to go down through, well, I did go down through Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and finished off in Australia. But when I was a few, maybe like two or three weeks into India, I don't know whether, whether it was the vitamin D or something that was just kind of making me productive or giving me <laughs> ideas. I was just sat in a coffee shop. Um, it was in, in Varkla in South India, uh, Kerala state. And I just thought, you know, everyone's out here. There's like some traveler vibe going on. Everyone's got a travel blog or anything like that. So I thought I want to do something, but I want to do something different. And I think it was just at the start of like when AHH was happening. Mm. Um, AHH, sorry. Um, uh, I was trying to think of a way I could tie field work into captivity. So because I was keeping a lot of stuff at home at the time as well, and I was seeing all these really cool you know, animals in India, I was trying to figure out a way that I could kind of improve my husbandry, but I was also trying to think, oh, what have I seen with a lot of these animals I'm keeping that would make it you know, easier for me to see or understand them in the, in the field. So I just came up with this idea of a journal. Um, you know, I definitely was not experienced enough at the, at the time. I think it took, it was really, I was like, you know, what can I call it? And I think I spent 20 minutes and I came up with Captain Field, you know, just to the point, um, sounded okay. And it, it, we just stuck with it. So I think I spent a few weeks kind of just coming up with a website and some ideas and then I eventually put a Facebook post out to the, the Bangor Uni Herb Society asking for any, if anyone was interested in reviewing articles, um, does anyone want to submit articles? And it was one of those things where I thought it's probably an idea that's just not going to you know, spark off and it's going to fizzle out as I travel. Um, one of those ideas that just collects dust for years and years. Um, but like immediately a couple of people got interested in reviewing and I got some articles sent over, um, like some really cool feeding reports of uh, water monitors in Bangkok and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, this is this is a thing now. Like, oh crap, I need to do this. <laughs> so were those people? Were those articles coming through just people who had done field work and just basically had had noticed some things while they were out there doing some research, and so they just put, compiled it into a short article so it could be reviewed? Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the things we did, like we we still kind of have this standards that we don't really accept like experimental papers or anything. Right. Um, I, I just didn't want to be taking kind of experimental papers from people who are way more experienced and qualified than I am, you know, and me almost deciding whether it's worth being published or not. Um, right. I thought, I thought, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take our time with approaching like that. So we'll stick to the, you know, the field observations and the captive ob- observations, um, you know, interesting feeding notes, breeding notes, um, anything like that. And I think, yeah, it was just people who had seen things a few years back, you know, they might see, I think one was um, somebody in Africa had seen a rock monitor up in a tree eating uh, Dendrolaphus, which was um, really, really cool. And it was, at first I was going around um, herping the globe on Facebook and if I saw anybody post a really cool photo, I was like, oh, that'd be really worth publishing. Here's our email. And there was a lot of that, and you know, there wasn't there wasn't much uptake from that, but there was a few just to get that first issue out, um, and it just kind of grew from there. And the first two or three years was slow, and there was a lot of people I already knew who were kind of publishing with us, or you know, who would review. And it was just after that, and especially now, it's starting to really grow, and you know, we're getting things submitted from people that you know I don't necessarily know, or I've never communicated with, and people are finding the journal completely independently of me kind of spamming groups and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So it's, 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 yeah, it's one of those, it's still a bit mad that it's the real thing. I, I thought, I just didn't think it would, it would stick. I, it was, it was really cool. Um, well, it, it's such a good idea because it, there is a massive gap between captive keeping and what the animals are experiencing in the, in, in the wild. And yeah. anything we can do to bridge those two worlds is, is super necessary. And I think there are, there's tons of people with, all that knowledge, you know, they have that experience, whether it's through captive experience of keeping or through, you know, 
being out in the field and there's just they don't haven't done anything with that information right they might not even because you know it's not just university academics who are publishing papers through your journal right they're people who are just you know breeders for example who are have an incredible amount of experience working with this animal and then they can publish their findings in the journal and it's super helpful for everybody yeah yeah exactly um i think one of the things we've tried to do as well is you know like and i certainly know from when i've submitted papers is you know you can get really kind of blunt and harsh reviews. And I understand completely that reviewers are tight on time. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's not a paid thing. It's completely voluntary. Um, but it can really put people off, um, understandably. So we I, we do really try to push for, you know, really um, just useful reviews. And, I you know, we've had a lot of people who maybe English isn't their first language or they've never published before or you know, undergraduate students. So we've, we've have tried to like help them through the process as well, you know, giving them lots of examples and giving them really good reviews. And one of the things I th- where we've been thinking about for the last maybe 18 months is doing like an open review system. So at the moment we have double blinds. So like the author doesn't know who reviews the paper and the reviewer doesn't know the author. So we remove all those details. Um, but we're thinking that once we get to the stage of publication, we might then release the reviews mm. onto like a, an archive on the website so it just kind of holds everyone accountable um, to make sure that you do give a decent review. Um, everyone kind of has mixed feelings about that. So it's always a catch-22 about losing good reviewers. Um, well, actually, a lot of reviewers do want to remain anonymous. Right. It's fair enough. Yeah, but, um, yeah we're, trying, we're trying to not just do what's already been done, I guess. Um, fill that gap. And yeah. Well, and it seems like the... The academic world is somewhat of there's somewhat of a gatekeeper mentality, right? You know, people that aren't involved in academics or, or at a university studying, you know, a lot of times they don't even have access to the information that's being produced, right? Everything's behind a paywall and things. And 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 for what you're yeah. doing, it's just it, it's almost the complete opposite of that. It doesn't feel like it's a gatekeeping situation. You don't have to be doing a PhD or doing a master's in order to read or or produce the papers. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, one thing we've always said is that we'll never charge for access to anything we'll never charge authors um because i think if you were to set up a journal without actually knowing how the system works you know almost like me when i set up this journal (laughs) um it's just such a mad idea to charge an author and to charge uh the reader Uh, you know especially the author it's just it baffles me that you know you have to pay to publish your work and it makes a lot of academics angry um but again, that trickles down to people who could really benefit from that information, like the keepers, because, you know, some good articles, you're talking thousands and thousands of pounds, um, which is, it's just crazy. Yeah. So we have, we have said that we will we'll never charge. Um, you know, the, when I first set it up, a lot of that time and money was just coming out of my own pocket because it wasn't a business at the time. It was, it was just the, the, the journal. Um, so we are trying to put a, kind of a system in place where we might be able to, you know, fund actually paying reviewers. Um, we're, I guess, trying to set an example of maybe how things should be done or how we'd like to see things done. But, you know, we we are still a small journal, um, but it would be nice to just do everything, stick to good principles and set that standard. Um, so that's kind of a hopeful plan for this year or next year. We'll see how it goes because... Uh, yeah, there's not much money in that game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, at some point, money does need to flow it to, to keep things moving. But I, I think I do like the philosophy of making sure that the actual information is out there for everybody. Are there any publications or any journals or articles that stand out to you of things that you are really fascinated by that's been published on the journal? Um, I'm sure there's lots. Yeah, there's what there's, there's one I can't talk about at the moment that is going to be coming out. Um, probably next week or the week after in the next issue, uh, which is which was really nice because it was somebody had found the journal completely independently. It's a really cool paper, you know, and they could have definitely published it in something bigger than ours, um, which was cool. Um, I'm trying to think back now because there's been so many articles now. I think we've published, I think just have it, like when we look back and we, we'll be hitting almost 50 published papers soon, and I think that more than any specific article really is just mind blowing to think that people have kind of trusted us enough. Yeah. We published that many papers with us. Uh, it I seems remember, like it's, it's, it's kind of an even split between captive work and field work as well. Or is it sort of like a 40, 60 or, or is it about 50, 50? 
Yeah, it's a, it's about 50-50. There's cer- I think there's certainly some issues where there's been more captive stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, I think every now and then there's a lot of kind of motivation which seems to sweep through the the captive side of things. Um, and people really kind of get into reading papers and writing papers. And then I think with the field stuff, a lot of people feel it's done once it's kind of put on Facebook or something like that. Uh, and what we do try to say to people, you know, it's, it'll be lost. It will, it will be gone. Like publishing these things and having them archived somewhere, you know, and then putting them on research gate afterwards. Um, it just kind of means it'll always be there and be so easy to find mm-hmm. for, for people. Um, yeah. It was, it, when I think back about how many people have published with us, it's just, it's just so cool. Really. It is, it is really cool to think that that was a little idea that's just grown into this, this thing that takes up all of my time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I think like it was about two years ago where the the guys who run the reptile database, they got in touch with us and basically said, can you send us everything you've got that you've published so we can get it up on there? Um, so that was really cool because it, it's just kind of like, you know, the everyday bits of herpetology are recognized in this thing that you've created. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's being respected. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, okay, so what I'm doing is actually worthwhile and and real and, and like, oh crap, like... <laughs> People are noticing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now the pressure's on. And, and for yourself, yeah. you've done lots of field work as well. And, and I weird with when we were talking to Ricky Johnson a couple of weeks ago, he had mentioned you, you know, pulling up some of the um, climate information for the natural habitat of leopard geckos. And and I, so I know you've spent lots of time in the field. Is there anything that you've pulled from those experiences that you've added to your captive husbandry or that you found to be, you know, not according to what the care sheet says, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of cookie cutter method that everybody keeps, whatever species it is. Have you gone into the field and gone, okay, we're doing this way off? Yeah, I think after the the first couple of years of spending a lot of time in the field, because those first couple of years, I really spent like eight or nine months. Like I was, I was get home and I'd book a flight and I'd be straight back out. And I was trying to organize all these kind of like locations for our future trips and stuff. But um I think one of the biggest things was understanding how humidity and temperature like really interact with each other. And I think I see a lot of people who are like, oh, this, you know, this animal comes from the rainforest, it's going to be humid. So you have these soaking wet enclosures. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a hard one. It's like once you've been somewhere where you find these species, you kind of really just, something clicks, I think, and you you you, you just have some kind of, weird understanding at the back of your brain mm-hmm. um yeah, there's something different about actually being in that environment because it's like your body picks up on things that you can't convey through words even or, or on a care sheet or, or as through just typed out advice right it's like you're you're there your body is actually feeling the sun feeling the the humidity the temperature and it's almost impossible to replicate just by you know giving someone advice yeah completely and i think one of the things i i will speak a lot about whenever I've given talks on, you know, kind of like the, just the, the base field work we do with the captive things is we see a lot of people now who are going and doing, you know, YouTube videos or Facebook posts or anything on social media where they go out and they find, you know, any common species that you see. And then they tell you about what temperatures they found them at and what the conditions were. And I think you've got to be very careful doing that because you have this very brief window into this animal's life and then people replicate it in, you know, a three or a four foot box. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas in reality, you need to be collecting that data, but you need to be controlling for it as well. So I, th- I think it was maybe like five years ago and I gave a talk at AHH um, and I was talking about how, you know, if when we find this animal here, we'll record like whatever um environmental data we're going to record but we're also going to go and do the same thing at a random location five meters away because we need to know is the animal seeking somewhere or is it avoiding somewhere um and yeah i just think it's so difficult to kind of just put specific numbers down on paper and then follow those for your husbandry um there's that niche within an area like a lot of people are taking air temperature but they're doing the next to their body and that really plays a big role when you when you measure air temperature and you're not holding it away from your body, you'll, you'll see a couple of degrees difference. Um, so there's just so, so many variables. And I think 
people can be very quick to base their entire husbandry off these small little chunks of information we have. And I'm not saying they're not useful. They definitely are. But I think we need to be super, super careful to make sure that we're kind of highlighting the fact that this is a part of this animal's life. And if you, if you, you know, say we saw a leopard gecko and we just saw it doing one thing, it was running around in an area. It doesn't mean that it's thriving in that area. Like, you know, it's, it might be evading a predator. It might be there temporarily. Um, but I, yeah, like I know some people, you know, they took our temperature readings in the evenings, but then they just applied them to like 24 hour care. Um, the animal was, you know, they're doing something completely different in the daytime and they could be doing something completely different six months from now. Yes. So I, I think like it, I definitely had that like, kind of switched that mindset as soon as I started going out to the field. And I think, especially when you start seeing how difficult it is to find things. So when we read all these environmental conditions online, you know, we say, I want to keep a Royal Python. And so I go into the native range and I find annual weather. And then I keep at those ambient temperatures in the summer a lot of the times, you know, those animals will be hiding from those temperatures in the middle of the day. Is there a need to provide those temperatures then? I don't know. It's there, uh, there's, there's a lot of cool studies which could be done with time and money. Yeah. But I, yeah, I think just thinking a bit more about like the niche that those animals actually occupy rather than the environment as a whole, because we're not, you know, unless we're going to start providing an acre of land, we don't need to provide all of those. Yeah, it doesn't need to be 45 degrees if the animal's hanging out at 25 degrees 90% of the time, staying away from that hot sun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think like, obviously the gradients have to be there. And I, I would definitely say that another thing I changed my mind about is like the enclosure sizes. Mm -hmm. I just got home and I wanted everything in as big as possible, not necessarily from the, you know, the exercise and the physical side of things, but the gradients you can provide when um, you have space. Uh, you, a lot of it, I think now with, you know, bioactive enclosures, I, nothing against bioactive enclosures, but I personally think you cannot replicate a forest floor in like four or five square feet of ground. It's mm -hmm. just, there's so much going on. Um, and it's a really cool principle, but I think space is what makes those things work. Yeah. Um, it is a really interesting problem. Just the more you talk about husbandry in that way, the more you realize how nearly impossible it is to do things in captivity and to even replicate the wild. It doesn't mean we shouldn't strive for it, but it needs to be very different. And I, I think I like that example of, you know, it's you got to be so careful about finding a, a one animal at one point in time in its day and then using that as your environmental parameters. Because like you said, that could be 0.5% of its day. You know, I'm drinking a coffee right now. If somebody saw me for 2% of my day, they're <laughs> going to know that I drink coffee and they're going to think, well, that guy drinks coffee. All he needs is coffee. And if my you know <laughs> caregiver just gave me coffee, I'd be bouncing off the walls. It'd be horrible. And But it, that's almost the same concept where, you know, they bask at 140 degrees, whatever it is. And and yeah, it, it's it's so complex. It's hard to even step forward into captive husbandry at some points. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the... I guess one of the actual experiences or like locations that really made me think about these things um, was in the northeast of India, where we visited the habitat of um, the bamboo rat snakes and the pseudoxenodon, the, the the large eyed bamboo false cobras, whichever order that is. Um, you know, you get these things in, and the people who have the most success is you know the people who keep them fairly cool. You know, and we know Oreo cryptophis. You don't, you don't keep them hot. Mm -hmm. That habitat, though, is scorching hot in the daytime. If you went there and we didn't already have, you know, baseline ideas of how to keep some of those species, you'd be like, oh, this thing needs to bask at 45 degrees. Um, so I know when I was keeping pseudoxenodon, I had the most success when I was providing really, really hot basking areas, but I placed my enclosures on a concrete floor, so the cold areas were really cold because – the minute the sun went in up at those altitudes, it got cold. Mm. Like you, we were, I think we were measuring one to three degrees on average when we were there in the evenings. And the water temperature on those, those streams was always below like five degrees. Um, wow. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you use centigrade or Fahrenheit, so that might make it confusing. Oh, no. I, 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 in Canada, we use, we use uh, Celsius, but I'm so, I mean, America is so close that most of my reptile has a <laughs> flips back and forth between the two. So, I'm, I'm uh, ampidextrous when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to temperatures. 
But yeah, no, five degrees, that's cool. I actually have this chart here for the Americans, five degrees, it's like 41 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's that's a cold, that's cold water. Yeah. So I remember walking through like an old dried valley in this area and, you know, we were looking for pseudozemidon and just thinking like, this is not what anyone does. Or nobody tries to keep them like this. Uh, at the time, I think I knew of a couple of people who were doing quite well with them. And they were just keeping them in a tub, but like a set kind of mid 20 centigrade um, range. Whereas I, I remember when I got a group, I had them in a really kind of how big, but it was a big enclosure. And I just used like a couple of halogens to really heat up one corner and they would bask in it, but then they could get away. So they weren't kind of dehydrating and, and cooking all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the same in, the, in those areas, you know, you find frogs, um, like torrent frogs, which you would never provide with really hot temperatures in the wild, but they're occupying a completely different niche. Whereas if you were just basing it off what you read online, you'd be just cooking these animals. It's yes. Yeah, yeah. That's what really changed. I think in my mindset was after visiting those areas at the higher altitudes, especially where you just see how temperature and, and humidity um, can kind of like vary drastically in the same habitat, just depending on the angle of the hill or, um where in the canopy you are especially those areas as well but like i'm i think like the current not belief or like trend maybe in keeping the the bamboo rat snakes it's probably that they you know i know a lot of people just give them like a turban loads of dirt the you know the fossorial snakes and wherever um so you wouldn't necessarily give them high uvi or anything like that those uvi re- readings up there i can't remember exactly what they were but they were comparable to you know, the desert in Rajasthan, they were, mm. they were high readings. As soon as the cloud opened up, you're, you're at such a high altitude, a UVI skyrockets. Um, right. But I don't think people would ever, I, they don't necessarily need to provide those levels because it depends if the snakes are coming out in that. Um, I know they do move around in the daytime. Uh, locals had caught them in the daytime before I got there. Uh, I was really keen to see one. And when we arrived at the, the house we were staying at, one of the locals had cooked and eaten one the day oh, before. <laughs> but that was a bamboo rat snake or the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but that he'd found that wandering around in the daytime. And that was that was dry season at the time as well. So, you know, it was, it was pretty warm and there was a lot of UV. But right. if you if you based your husbandry on what that snake was doing, I'm sure it wouldn't do very, very well um, for very long. Exactly. So did you find any at night or did you have any, any success finding them? No, unfortunately... When I was there, we didn't get much um, because it was such a, like it was in the middle of the dry season, but it was the only time I could visit. Mm, gotcha. um, so yeah, we, we were hiking up and just kind of taking notes on the habitat and things. Um, but yeah, you get you get um, some green pit vipers there. And again, like you'd never dream of keeping green pit vipers in a habitat, which you put into single digits, you know, it's tropical viper. Mm-hmm. Um, but at, at one of the places we've, you know, we've, we've been kind of studying snake bite in recently in Himachal Pradesh. That place gets cold and you get green pit vipers there. Um, you get Indian crates and these are all snakes which you find in tropical India. Right. Um, but they're also found up in, in the hills over there. And you're, you can, you can get colder than the UK, you know, you're in the Himalayan foothills. Um, so it's it sort just of, kind of begs some questions too. I mean, just keeping it, it's much easier to keep animals warm in, in some ways than, than cold. I mean, anything under, 16 or 15 degrees celsius is difficult to put into a home unless you have an outside building that you can actually control at a much cooler temperature but you certainly aren't going to make your bedroom and your your spare room in your home 10 degrees it'd be virtually impossible <laughs> yeah exactly so i think i think it just kind of begs the question of what these animals are doing at these different times um and i i think what might happen is that we kind of keep these animals at the temperatures where they might be active and they might bask, um, but we never actually provide those areas or those, those chunks of time where they just disappear because it's too hot or it's too cold. I mean, even like places like central Thailand, they can get, you know, can get below 10 degrees Celsius and you've got things like King Cobra there, which I just, it just doesn't fit in the mind alongside cold temperatures. Right. Um, but when you do think about, you know, where things like King Cobra and stuff come from in China or, or uh, I'm not trying to end up like Nepal where it does get really, really um cold there's a lot of the other commonly kept species in those areas you know um in central time you get the green castings boiga sinea that area gets below 10 degrees and you're getting them there i'm pretty sure 
people are never keeping part of that cold. No, they don't want to keep themselves that cold. So the reptiles certainly <laughs> yeah. are getting that cold. Well, and it's, it, it's sort of like, I wonder how important, maybe you have an opinion on this, how important replicating the seasonality is because you could see somebody make an argument for saying, okay, I'm just going to replicate the two months of the year that the animals are actually active, maybe they're out basking during the day because the sun isn't super hot at that time. This is the humidity and the temperature during that time. And I'm just going to stretch that over the full 12 months every single year instead of putting them through this big wave. And that way, you know, maybe you can promote a more active snake so you can see it more often. But I'm sure there are some downsides to that as well. Do you have an opinion on, on replicating seasons? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had some of our best success last year from, from doing that, really. Um I, yeah, I, I think because I had a bit more time because of COVID last year, we started playing around with um, creating like seasonality cards for our enclosures. So we basically produced a card and I just had like a hot season, a wet season, a hibernation season, and then the, the first letter of each month. And I just circle off, you know, I do a bit of research into where those animals were from specifically, circle off when it would be a wet season, um, when it would be hot or cold, wherever stuck those two enclosures because so it's always kind of easy there you know it's not always easy to remember everything uh, necessarily and after like four years of trying that was the first year we got the spilotes to breed and it was like there was just so like everything went as it should um i guess you know it was i i was reading up on the air and it's kind of like they have kind of two rainy seasons but it's still not dry in the dry dry season um so yeah, as soon as the beginning of the rainy season hit, they bred. Eggs were laid by the end of the first rainy season. Um, and, and it's that's happened the uh, Splodies, that's the Amazon puffing snake? or is that, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah like I'm, we should have another clutch any day now, and it's worked out with two pairs, um, just trialing awesome. this, this method. Um, so we did it with the sail fins, and it all worked out. But yeah, I think, you know, there's enough studies out there now, I think that, do highlight the benefits of, of especially like seasonal change, which um, coincides with hibernation. And I just, I don't think there's enough which looks into, you know, the other changes, the rainy seasons, the humidity, um, air pressure and whatnot. That, you know, if you look at any of the, the kind of climate predictions for reptiles, it certainly looks like humidity is the, the driving factor on their success during climate change, not necessarily temperature. So, I, yeah, I don't think we give humidity enough of a, um, I guess, a pedestal. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it, just, it plays a huge role. And I think when you have these, you know, larger enclosures and you can provide this humidity and keep the enclosures dry and whatnot, um, I think that alters behavior a lot more than we would expect it to. I think we're very temperature focused. Yes. When keeping our dogs. Um, Which is funny because we know ourselves how much humidity plays a role in how you feel when you go outside i mean humidity and temperature are two separate things but they have this massive convergence together synergy together that really change the way you feel i mean if you go outside and it's 30 degrees and the humidity is 20 percent, it's not that bad but if you go outside at 30 degrees and the humidity is 85 percent, you're pretty much dying because it's just it feels like the heat is sticking to you and so it, it does play a huge role yeah yeah exactly i mean i remember speaking to some of the guys in India when we were looking for saw scale vipers. Um, and some of those guys were keeping them for some of the, um, the venom lines. And they were like, yeah, like Echis um, hates water. You just do not give them water. And then you see some of these snakes and they're just not great. <laughs> and then we went and visited Rajasthan and we camped in the desert for a while to look for them. Even though it's scorching hot and dry in the daytime, every single night I was there, there was light rain. So, you know, th this is, this is, that was, yeah, that was kind of a, a moment where I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, if I was to keep something from this desert, it's, it is literally just sand as far as the eye can see. Right. Um, I will have probably uh, kept it on just sand. It's like the old belief where like Euromastics should never have access to a water bowl and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, this is the kind of habitat Euromastics would come from. It's where you get Sarah Hardwickai, like the Indian Euromastics, I guess. Um, but yeah, they have access to water every night and every morning because it's yeah. it just dries off so quickly, but the humidity spikes so high in the evening. Right. Yeah, I think in a captive setting, we would be kind of saying that we're going to give them a respiratory infection if we if we provide them with too much humidity. But just make sure the humidity is low in the daytime, I think. Yeah, just light mist at night, spike. crank the temperature, let it dry out, and just go through that 
humidity cycle. Well, it's funny because that's when humans are sleeping. So every time you experience the desert, it's hot as hell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you yeah, don't exactly. go there at nighttime, you're not going to experience the light rain that happens that 100% the animals absolutely rely on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, and I, yeah, I think when, I think observer bias is definitely something that people should know about when they're reading through a lot of these, you know, field reports and things like that. It's, and if you, I'm not saying it's anyone's fault or anything like that. It's just one of those things. You see something really cool and then you get all these ideas and kind of think like ways you can keep these animals or, you know, oh, I saw this snake on that tree. It looked really cool. Let me just set up this mm -hmm. branch like this and whatnot, uh, make this fake pond or whatever. But in reality, you know, I, I've heard of a lot of, um, I guess people having difficulties, you know, when they've created these huge water features to keep this animal that they've you know there's photos of in the wild swimming or whatnot um but in reality like that habitat is very different outside as it, when you compare it to inside an enclosure mm -hmm. um you know I, I think even like things like grass snakes which you you commonly see swimming around and near water sources so you just combine can find that environment in an area which you know has reduced airflow or whatever you're going to run into issues um you know, with, with fungus or scales or whatever. Um, and I think you just have to think a little bit more about how that environment's going to work, maybe increased airflow or, or whatever, but I you know it can, it can be done. I just think you have to think about it a little more. Um, and again, it's one of those things I think where enclosure size comes in, comes into play. It's, I guess you more variety. It's one of those things I remember when I first started keeping things, you know, I always like to create these fake tree, it, trees in the corner of my enclosures and the roots would come down and stuff and i'd always have this vision of a snake perfectly sat at the bottom yeah um, i've had that same image in my head like oh make a yeah. buttress root that's where they're always found yeah yeah never found a snake at the bottom of one of those <laughs> <laughs> every time i kind of look it's like oh it's gonna be a really cool snake curled up at the bottom now i never have <laughs> yeah yeah it's just like that happened once on and someone filmed it and we all assume that that's where they all hang out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure like every person that keeps Gaboon Vipers or Bushmasters has probably got that image. Um, yeah. I, I, don't, I, th I think there's probably more chance with those species, but yeah, I've, I've never had the, the luck. <laughs> well, that's the interesting thing about herpetoculture is that we operate so much on... So I don't. I hesitate to use the word myths, but I'm going to use it anyway. Uh, myths about these animals, and I'm not even saying some of the myths are are not a bad thing. Like it, maybe it does promote better husbandry, but there is really keeping a reptile captive and that the wild counterpart of that same species are two so separate things and so different. And it doesn't mean we want to strive. We do want to strive for creating that wild habitat, but it's amazing how many myths and sort of funny artifacts that we have within the hobby that actually have no backing in reality, but we just repeat them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's the, yeah, I think like, especially around like feed and what snakes feed on and stuff. Like, mm. and obviously snakes do eat a lot of, you know, small mammals and rodents and birds and things, but snakes diet is way more varied than people expect this to be like a lot of the species we keep commonly will feed on snakes and lizards and they play a big role in the diet um amphibians like amphibians make up such a large part of snake diet where it's just yeah i guess it's it's not something we think about and it's always these yeah it still it still baffles me a little bit we still have these ideas in our head where like you know you feed a snake this size this week this you know then it goes to two weeks and then three weeks and wherever it's like it's not like that so you see some snakes in the wild, or so you you catch one, and it will regurge like five plus prey items. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like it's okay to do that sometimes, but then maybe you know just give it one small thing afterwards, and they're not eating these same size meals every single week or wherever. It's. I think we had one really cool publication. It might have been in volume three of a uh, Xenopeltis, the sunbeam snakes. Mm -hmm. It was a size record, but also, from what I remember, I think it regurged like twenty plus frogs. Oh my god! So it just been it just been out that evening um, feasting. So frogs come out in the rain, and right. it was just feasting and feasting and feasting. But you know, when people keep sunbeam snakes in captivity, they're on rodents, um, and yeah, you can do that. But I think just more thought in that area would be really cool. And, you know, see what we can come up with. I'm sure there's things we could come up with to make these, these, um, diets more exciting. You know, we do have access to 
to frogs. And I think that's definitely in the States and I'm not sure in Canada, but I think there's people making like the, like the sausages essentially to feed snakes yeah. these days. You can put all sorts into those. I did have a go at doing that, but um, yeah, I, I kind of made a horrible mess of things with blending up different prey items. Yes, and- yeah. Ashley the Zan from uh, Northern Lights Imports does that. And she, so she does all these different <laughs> making your sausages and whatnot. It seems pretty gross, but like you said, you can do a lot with that. And there's there's a few companies in the states that do it as well that actually you know put together good sausages with with things. So yeah, there's there's a lot of variety. There's a lot of place to grow rather than just the frozen rodents. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's yeah. We just we try to apply the same thing to kind of everything that we can get our hands on. I guess um, it's like the the puffin snakes, for example. Like our largest male is about eleven foot. But in you know he never he never eats like an adult sized rat. It's probably like a half grown rat and chicks and stuff. And mm-hmm. like I, I always try to base it off like oh if he's gonna get chicks I might give him two three or four because he's you know he might nest raided if it, if he was out in the wild. Um, if he has a rodent I might give him one or two because he might have, it might have been like an opportunistic meal. And we've kind of grouped our snakes into into like uh, what we call like A B C and D. Um, with uh, A being like the most frequent feeders, so like the younger snakes, and then D being the snakes which might feed a little bit less frequent. But those groups are not like weekly. It's more like once to three times in the week, and D might be, you know, every four to six weeks or something. Um, so it is all kind of random, and it's not like I have to feed my snakes on this day. And, I, yeah, I think, it just, yeah, it, it kind of does shock me a little bit. Those ideas are still so firm. And I, I guess it is easy it does fit into routine for some people. So it's kind of easy idea to sell, but yeah, it's, it's such a simple part and like such a common part of like snake natural history. that I think we, we should kind of maybe know a little bit better. Now. Well, I think there's also this interplay between what I call pet keepers and then people who are like more sort of project seekers. So people like you yeah. and I, and most people who are listening to the podcast who want a more complex project. So they're happy to get into the nitty gritty where if you're a pet store selling a snake, like you're just going to say, feed the snake every two weeks, this rat. And it just becomes that sort of concrete, bam, bam, bam. That's how you care for it. And there's like two worlds that are constantly battling against each other. And I think it just creates those, those myths. A rat every two weeks is how this snake lives. And that's probably what they do in the wild. But really in reality, it's couldn't be further from the truth. Oh yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad it's not me that just sees that like two, yeah, two bubbles of reptile keeping. I guess is the, yeah, I guess it's like that one side that definitely appreciates kind of the natural history side of things a lot more. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like what we, I guess, tailored captive and field to a lot of the time because I think sometimes if you try to explain what you're doing to you know more the traditional pet keeper side of things it's not going anywhere. It just really isn't going anywhere. Yeah. Um, and you know, fair enough. Some people don't have an interest in the field herp inside of things. You know, they don't have to, um, but yeah, it's, 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 I don't know. I think it's just that that's the side of keeping. I really, really love is that kind of doing it as wild as I can. Um, I think it's just a different appreciation for the animal. And I think that that's where you generally see these kind of more unusual colubrids or, um lizards you know where people have always said they're so difficult to keep alive and stuff um but they're not it's just that a bit unusual and a few have been tried and people got it wrong in the past and they got labeled as this they're impossible to, to keep alive exactly well and i think a lot of reptile keepers who are a little bit more advanced than just the person that went to pet smart yesterday and bought their first ball python you know most people are actually pretty fascinated at the wild counterpart of the animal that they keep. And there's a great example going around right now. I don't know if you've seen on Facebook with Dave Kaufman. He's currently in Africa doing uh, some research, or I don't know if you call it research, but he's investigating, you know, wild populations of ball pythons. And I've been sort of amazed at how much excitement has been generated around sort of both sides. Like you have the advancing side of people who are saying like, look, that's great. He found it basking. And then another picture of a, you know, a, a ball python that's found in a hole. And of course the, the morph breeders are super stoked about that. And it will be interesting <laughs> to see how the interplay comes in across whatever content he eventually creates. I'll, I'll be curious to see it. I think it'll be kind of fascinating, but there is a huge interest there. People who are just completely basic bare bones rat keepers are fascinated at where these animals are being found as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where like, I think we have, like, again, like we have to be careful about how it's portrayed. Exactly. Um, it's very cool to see all that stuff. And again, like you said, like, you know, rock keepers are very quick to be like, oh, he found it in a hole. So that's okay. We can do what we want to do, but it's observer bias. Like you're, and people forget that 
when a snake's out of its uh, kind of hole or wherever it hides, they're very, very difficult to find. Like you don't just walk into Africa and find royal pythons when they're out and about. You know, nine times out of 10, I think you, you could be staring or walking past your, the snakes you're looking for. Um, yeah. You know, I've been out in the field with so many people and they've walked past a four or five foot Russell's Viper and it was out in plain sight. You know, these things are designed to not stand out. And it, I would say when you're out there and you can, you know, you, you meet up with the guys who know where these animals are, they can show you where the burrows are where all pythons and, and whatever. Like, so it, uh, you do get a lot of observer bias, uh, you get a lot of confirmation bias, and then people justify like the way they keep things. But we, there, there's nothing to, to, I guess, yeah, you're never going to have an equal amount of observations of them outside of their burrows. It's mm-hmm. just the way it is. It's so much harder to find them doing that. Um, but yeah, the argument comes in of how should we do it because of how often we find them in burrows. And that's just... Yeah, it's an argument that's hard to get yeah. in and get out of quickly. Um, well, I always say, well, then then make a make a burrow, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. make it make an actual burrow. You know, the picture that he posted was a, a snake that looked pretty deep underground and had you know had some dirt kind of swept away so you could see its scales and does not look like a sterile bare tub to me. And yeah. so yeah, it's in a tightly bound hole and that's probably spend who knows how much it could be in the hot season. It spends a lot of time down there. That's cool. But like you said, when they're out and about, they are much harder to find. But we could still replicate that. You could still actually spend some time creating an underground area that would replicate you know, sort of these caverns that they spend time in. That's different than just, you know, the, the newspaper. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's, it comes back down to like the really simple principle of like, you know, that we've had in his husbandry for a long time, which is providing like cool, humid hides. But a lot of people don't realize that that's like a major part of like this complex environment that we always think of when we think of these wild reptiles where, you know, if you, if you want to use the argument of it, it was underground in this tight space, so I'm going to keep it like that. I'm pretty sure you're not going to keep that dark, tight space wet and humid and full of sand either because you're going to run into issues. Like mm-hmm. my, I would assume that that animal is probably coming above ground fairly frequently to bask and dry off because we know what happens when snakes are too damp for too long. Um, but yeah, like you said, those, those habitats play such a key role in, you know, avoiding the area when it's too hot um or if they um if they need to digest a meal or something like when we when we did the little bit of tracking for the russell's vipers we were finding females who are gravid living in tight areas underground like that so we tracked to like an old termite mound and you just look down the hole with the torch and you could see her you know a few feet underground where it is damp and cold but if you tracked earlier in the morning she would be outside the entrance basking mm-hmm. so she's kind of getting that bit to dry off and get up to temperature and incubate the um the embryos but then she's going back down once she's done that and i think you know you two people can pass the different times and base the right um findings on completely different keeping styles so i I, yeah i I don't know if people are very quick to to fight i guess when they see these things and get defensive um and i think people should probably be a little bit more opens to both sides exactly because uh, conversely you don't want to create a ball python environment that only offers open basking in the with the bulb and not have any ability for them to seek refuge underground or into a, a, a tight small maybe humid burrow you have to apply both but you can't take like you said one moment in one part of the day and then a different moment in the other part of the day so you have half the community that keeps their ball pythons as they are at night and the other half that keeps them as they are in the morning and nobody's keeping them correctly yeah yeah exactly yeah it's one of those things where i do think you have to be very careful because you could very easily kind of accidentally mislead someone i guess Mm -hmm. um into like i said earlier like cooking their animal um but it's one of those things as well when you really start to think about all the you know i'm not saying you have to provide every single little niche of the animals found in all the time but when you start to go down that line you know these enclosure sizes get a lot bigger um i guess there's always the question as well of you know of why is somebody keeping this animal and i'm sure you know people have different reasons and then they justify the way they do things differently um but yeah i mean i after seeing you know i've not seen royal pythons in the wild but i've seen snakes that fill similar niches even like when we've seen the eric's species the the ground bows in um or the, the ground pythons in in india that's an animal you just keep in a turban sand. Mm-hmm. You know, people, that's what people do. Um, and they do just fine. But 
most of those I've found in India throughout the year have been above ground. Um, even in the first snake I ever found in India was a massive Eryx Johnny, and that was found nowhere near loose substrate. It was out on rock and concrete in the middle of the day. It was scorching hot, mm-hmm. um, and it was a completely healthy animal. It was an old animal. It was, I remember it was like missing one eye, had some scars, <laughs> yeah. but it was a been good, through some stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it must have been such an old animal um, because I've never, I've never seen one as big as since. But that 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 was a habitat that was conditions that animal was experiencing, and you know, it was, it was out there doing its thing. And you'd never keep one like that. You'd never, mm-hmm. you'd never kind of provide that big space where it can then go and burrow and then it come out and do its own thing. Because um, everyone's just kind of lumps them into that same group as like uh, Xenopeltis and and whatnot, where they just live on the ground all the time. Right. But, yeah, they're these like fossorial snakes. You see them out in India fairly frequently. Um, they'll they'll be. I mean, we even see in the Madhya Pradesh. We we frequently find blind snakes out after heavy rains. That's the snake that's fossorial, but you know that's a perfect example of a fossorial snake being spending a lot of time above ground. Yeah, and that um, it doesn't get more fossorial than blind snakes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we've had the evenings where you're tripping over the things, and I know, <laughs> yeah, because it's rained and they're coming up, but um sometimes you know you, you you'll find them in kind of loose rock and stuff but they're not they're not far underground mm. um and obviously the underground aspect is, is a massive part of their, their natural history and you know keeping that i'd assume if anyone's keeping blind snakes but um yeah i think people are very quick to jump on to this is how the snake spends the majority of time it's the only way to keep it um i don't know for me i think like just go bigger and it'd be cool to see it doing something different once in a while because you've got that chance then, you know, maybe you'll see the snake climbing around on a different thing once every six months, but it, it's still a cool, um, a cool moment, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Larger size, more opportunities to do different things. And yeah, if, if they only use those certain things once a year, that's still pretty cool. And that's probably part of their natural history as well. And I wanted to talk about the the expedition side to to your mm. your your business because that actually sounds like it gives people the opportunity to have these experiences with you or with somebody yeah yeah um yeah so that was so that wasn't too long after i started captain field which was at the time it was just a journal um so i was traveling through india and then my um master supervisor so i've not long finished my masters at banga who's currently my phd supervisor as well put me in touch with Vishal Sandra in West Bengal. Because um, I was like, you know, I want to go find some Russell's Vipers. I want to see some Cobras and stuff. India was really difficult at times. It was such, I was there kind of in the dry season. And every time I went to a different state, it just happened to be I was in the dry season as well. Because mm. um, I was doing all the touristy stuff and whatnot as well. So I met up with him and, you know, we we went up to the Northeast to that habitat where I said the, the Pseudozenodon were. Um, so we were just kind of doing a lot of suit touristy stuff we were looking at rhinos we were in the tiger reserves and whatnot and then i got back to his in west bengal after about a week and he was like just stay just delay your trip to thailand like just just stay here for a week um so yeah just decided to and he uh, i think it was like the next morning we we went out to these fields um to look for russell's vipers and we looked around for a little while and eventually he just points, like we're walking on this like elevated mud path um, with these kind of like, I don't know what the, the crop was. It was some kind of crop or plant growing on the sides of these slopes and then ponds in the middle. Mm. And he just points down and he's like, there's a Russell Viper there. Like, Are you sure? Like, the, I, I'm not seeing one. Um, so he's like, yeah, just, just walk down there. Um, he hand, I think he handed me a pair of tongs. And I, as soon as I kind of got, level with it on the same area of that slope it was just this beast of a russell's viper basking on a kind of on top of this plant and as i was looking at that snake maybe 30 foot behind it there was these two guys in this like knee deep in this plant um with you know no footwear on no handwear and they were collecting that crop and i remember that was the moment where i was like oh shit this is this is what indian snake bite is this is why it's happening like they're heading straight to there. There's probably way more in here. Um, and that, eve- so we, we caught the snake and we, we went on to have like, I think we ended up, because we were doing some venom stuff at the time as well. Michelle was collecting venom for some other projects. I think we caught 
if I remember right, it was like 13 Russell's Vipers wow. and it was like a couple of hours. It's We've been back to this field a few times now and it's always just crazy, you know, an hour and a half or two hours in the morning and you always get 10 to 15 Russell's Vipers. It's wow. just a crazy area. There's monocle cobras there you see and rat snakes and everything. But yeah, the Russell's Vipers are just insane. Um, yeah, so that evening we just kind of sat down had a couple of beers and I'd already had the the thing in the back of my mind of like, it'd be really cool to run these like tours and show people what we're doing, give them an idea of, you know, what wild herbs are doing. Um, and we somehow got talking and decided that like people need to know about what Indian snake bite is. Cause I remember thinking you get taught about it in uni lectures and stuff. Um, you know, and it sounds bad, but kind of you go home that evening, you go bed to bed and you forget about it. Um, but I, it just stuck with me when I saw how it was happening I was like it's just so easy um you know you meet families that that have been devastated by it or you meet people who've survived it but they've had life-changing injuries Mm. um so yeah we were like you know this this could help us raise some money for Captain Field to run the journal and we could do some outreach work but also bring people out and we could teach them about snake bite um you know so Vishal was going to help me with the snake bite stuff and then I was thinking oh people come out we can show them how to collect environmental data and um, how that could be translated into a captive setting and just try and kind of build that understanding. So we, Vishal at the time had permits for Sri Lanka because he was doing some work for a serpentarium at the university there. So we advertised, you know, I was very naive at the time and we kind of came up with this plan for Sri Lanka and I advertised thinking, oh, this is going to be so easy to fill, you know, like eight spaces or something, we'll just advertise and, you know, everyone's going to book on. So I got super excited advertised not even one booking um obviously realizing that people have no idea who we are i look back at the quality of the website and you know stuff back then and say like, oh, you know of course they didn't you know, they, we could have been anyone yeah, They're asking yeah. People a lot of money so yeah that kind of flopped and then so i was back in bangor and i was going to some of the uni like herpsock um meetings every monday and stuff and i got thinking well if I organize like an Easter trip to Europe, which is fairly cheap, you know, I know a lot of the students, we can get them on. We'll get a lot of uh, material and photos from the field. And then we can just start to build a bit of credibility and get some ratings and testimonials and stuff. So we did that. And the first trip we did was Croatia and Slovenia. So we took people out and we were trying to, so we ran the whole trip where we didn't go to anywhere that we knew had herbs so we didn't, you know, we didn't ask people for locations. We didn't go to known locations. We just did research from um, like natural history publications, uh, Google Maps and stuff, and just ID'd good habitat and, and went there. And we were trying to teach the students how to do that as well. Because one of the things we have in the UK with adders is like the habitat gets ruined because people go in there so often and disturb these snakes to the point where it actually affects their, um, their like well-being, I guess. So we were trying to teach students, like, look, you can go, you can you can learn a little bit about the snake's behavior. Um, well, not necessarily snakes, I guess. Um, learn about her habitat, learn about seasonal differences and stuff, and then just target your approach properly. Um, so in principle, it was a great idea, and I was, like, super excited. So we, And we get to Slovenia first, and spring had kind of started a month before, but then storms came in, so we were, like, knee-deep in snow in the mountains. So I'm thinking, oh, this is this idea is ruined. Um, but amazingly, like we we persevered, we got fire salamanders, you know, so the students were super happy with that. And then we went down to Croatia for the second half and we just we just ticked off everything. Like it it just worked. It was I couldn't have asked for it to have been any better. Um, you know, we wanted to get Amadites vipers. We managed to tick those off on one of the islands where they're quite hard to find. And I, I was just so happy because I was like, this idea might actually kind of... And that was work. all based, like, again, that you were still using just your own research, your own natural history and IDing locations. All of that success was due to that rather than asking people and going to, where can I find these animals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's it was amazing. me... Um, That's kind of a James risk Hicks. almost because you could have easily showed up somewhere and gone, yeah, there's like a, a condo set up here <laughs> that wasn't on Google Maps or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was... Um, it was, it was, yeah, it was interesting at times. Like it was me and a good friend, James Hicks. Um, so we were kind of just putting our brains together to, to figure out where, where we should try and hit. And, you know, if we drove past anywhere that looked good, we would kind of note that down and in the evenings we'd have a look at it and 
try and find old papers and be like, okay, cool. You know, we might get, um, we might get the, the horned vipers here or, um, or whatnot. So we did, we had, we had some fun ones, like the, the accommodation in Croatia definitely wasn't used to like 10 herpers coming in and staying there and whatnot. Um, and it was stressful. Like when we, when we, when we went to Slovenia, it was super stressful. So I was like, we're not going to find anything. This snow is real, but we did, we, you know, we got, toads and um agile frogs breeding in like little pockets that were open in these frozen lakes and that, that was really cool in itself to see um and then yeah eventually we got the fire salamander so we kind of ticked off that kind of really cool species for slovenia i guess and um that kept the students happy because that's like the you tend to find with young students that like in the first or second years they need to find something cool every day mm-hmm. yeah the trip gets really really bad so it's always kind of panicking if we hadn't had anything cool by the evening um but yeah when we got to croatia it's just you know the weather was good and it, it just worked you know we, there was all these really cool little um lacerted species that we wanted to see i think we got uh yeah we got a leopard snake just before we, we drove onto the island when we stopped for like food um somebody saw a leopard snake basking on the side of the road and that's like such a hard snake to find in that area and we got one i just couldn't have asked for any better because every, every student on that trip had like a highlight species um, so the following year, we kind of fell into collaboration with Anita Mahotra from Bang University, who's done loads of really cool work on snake bite and green pit viper taxonomy. Because uh, she was working with Vishal at the time as well. So we advertised spaces for Himash Pradesh and we managed to fill a couple. And then we did again in 2019. Um, on between that, we did a Portugal trip as well, which is another like Easter trip for the students. Uh, to try and like wing it and you know see see if we could find these things without going to these known locations and it it worked again it was it was kind of nice it was confirmed that it wasn't just fluke the first time yeah yeah um you know everyone had these things we wanted to see i really wanted to see the timon leopardus the 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 jewel eyed lacerted i guess um and it was we just couldn't find one and then we got one on the last day uh this really touristy area massive mail um within like 10 minutes of getting there awesome which was really yeah which was really cool um and then yeah that, that just kind of allowed us to grow really slowly to the point where people kind of knew who we were and they trusted us and they're like oh yeah you know what we you are legit you can take us to the field um and like we we've, we've been stuck because of covid but we've just we've got a trip coming up in july um which we managed to fill up. I don't know whether people were saving money through COVID or something. It was a bit easier to to get people booked on, but yeah, that'd be really cool to get to get back out there. And so that um, one's filled by just you know people who not just necessarily students. It's just people who are interested in either keeping or just interested in going herping into the field, and and they're going to come along with you. Yeah, yeah. So we've not like filled it, filled it because we didn't. We decided to not like go crazy with the advertising and just kind of you know wean ourselves back into it um, with the way you know. We haven't traveled since COVID, so we need to kind of readjust, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so we've got some people who are coming out to actually do, uh, you know, more of the academic side of things and, and learn how to sample things for taxonomy work. Um, I think, you know, one guy's coming out to do some of his master's work. Um, and the guys I'm working with on that, he's coming out to do his PhD work. And then we've got a girl coming who, so she's, I think she's going to veterinary school or she's currently in veterinary school and she wants to do some other um, like exotic work afterwards. Um, but she wants to have like a, a background knowledge of the natural history of the animals and how to sample them and stuff. So she can get a lot out of the trip. So, you know, we'll, we generally allow people to get hands on and we'll teach them how to take blood from a snake, how to do the scale clips. We'll do venom extractions, but like we won't let anyone do those because a lot can, <laughs> can go wrong Yeah, yeah. Uh, in remote locations in India. So, um, yeah, and, you know, we get people that just want to come out and take photos. Uh, we've had people that want to come out and, you know, they're really interested in the snakes and stuff, but they actually really want to just come and see some cool birds or some really cool insects. Um, and it's usually quite good because, we, we, you know, we know people out there. We can get those guys to come out with us and they know loads more about the birds than we do or, right. or whatnot. Um, so everyone can kind of get what they want out of the trip because some people just want to come out and take photos and you know, they're not too fussed about getting hands on, which is quite nice as well because, you know, I, my, I've kind of switched my mindset a little bit, whereas before I had to like catch everything. Um, now it's, you know, if, if we've got a purpose too, we need to sample those animals, whether, you know, we will, but 
you actually see a lot of cool stuff. You just don't dive on things immediately. Um, yeah. Even with things like Cobras and stuff, it was just before COVID where we watched Cobra chasing down a Russell's Viper to eat it. Like we saw the whole to see in that Cobra and just caught it. We didn't ever even know that Russell's was there probably. Right, um, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's better to just step back and let nature happen in front of you. Yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely this thing where, yeah, I guess, you know, and I'm guilty of it, where I hope is just want to catch everything because it's the, the done thing. But I'm pretty sure a lot of like mammal people wouldn't be doing that if they're, you know, out in Africa yeah. looking at yeah, exactly. Well, and also <laughs> as the business owner too, like there's probably a bit of like anxiety of making sure that things do get captured so people can have an experience with that animal. So you probably want to go like, hey, let's get these animals going so we can at least, you know, check them off the list type thing. So I could see why as yourself, you'd want to, you know, make sure that that's happening. But yeah, I'm sure if you just go at it at a more relaxed tempo and go, let's just sit back and, and enjoy what's in front of us, you're going to see so much more. Yeah, yeah. And of course, yeah, there is that that risk. Um I've had it before where, you, you know, the first day out in India where somebody's not necessarily been to the field before. So they don't realize that a lot of people think that you get to the tropics and snakes are just everywhere. Like yeah. people think that yeah. it's like the jungle book, you know, there's going to be a python hanging off every branch and <laughs> trying to squeeze you or whatever. But um, yeah, you can't, I think it's, it's hard to like tell people what to expect without putting them off, I guess, because, you know, you can go two weeks of, intense work without actually seeing a snake like they can be right. so hard to find especially up in the himalayan regions you know all it takes is for the conditions to change a little bit and everything is just gone um the last time we ran a trip that we went a little bit later because we wanted to see how the rains change things and we really want to find coral snakes and i like, confirmed them from that region but that brought landslides so we kept getting landlocked and um it would just put us back for days and days and you know when you've got people you are paying to be out with you um you still need to keep them entertained and stuff. And, you know, luckily we had a good group and they did understand and we eventually did get coral snakes. So everyone was super happy. Oh, cool. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's the first night. It's like, if you haven't found anything that first evening, you know, it's trying to tell people like, don't worry, like we will, we will see things. Yeah, uh, yeah. It will happen. Um, it won't be like this every night. I've had it a few times. We go on a road cruise and you're there for like five hours. Think we've got to see we've got to see something other than a stick on the road. Um, yeah. Yeah, that happened the last time. We spent ages and ages and ages. And eventually we got, um, I think we got a green pit viper. And then a little while after that, we got a really big common crate, which was really, that was a brilliant instruction for people when they were getting out to the field for the first time. Um, but then if it goes too well on the first night, you've got to be careful because then people can be really disappointed for the rest. Yeah, yeah. You might get three <laughs> or four nights of nothing and go, what the hell is this? But I'm sure anybody going out into the field understands that you're going into nature. You're not going into YouTube and typing in a species to see. You're 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 getting the mud on the on on the on the boots and it's whatever happens, happens. There's really no way to control it. Yeah, exactly. Like there's no there's no like play at two times speed or you know, yeah. skip 15 seconds that's right? what it feels like when we get to watch the you know the videos of the herpers that have gone and done it but if you're actually out there it's you're seeing two percent of the actual trip or or less you know when someone makes a video as far as the the snake bite work goes you know, I kind of mentioned that moment that you had that you realized that you want to start having some impact here so what have you been able to do have you have, have you guys been able to help alleviate that problem at all i mean it's such a massive problem but yeah, I mean, I can't take loads of credit for like what's come out so far. You know, I've, like Vishal has done an incredible amount of work in India. Um, you know, you speak to the locals in the surrounding areas of where he lives, and they just they know who he is. He's he's done an in, he's created this organization with incredible outreach. Um, where you know he's got rescuers, he's got like a rescue network now. So if somebody has a snake in their house, they can very quickly phone someone, and there will be like a network of people, or it'll end up getting to the right person who can go and remove it. And you know they all do education work at every single removal. Um, and then Sarish, the guy who who's helped me with the last trip, he's been out there as well, helping them set up a way to like collect the data from that as well, so you can actually you know pull um, epidemiology studies out of that. Um, and then, you know, Anita's done really, really cool work with the the actual venom. Um, and, and I think Anita and Vishal have been key in setting up collaborations with a lot of people. Like they, they have really, you know, pulled 
this like the team that we're currently part of like you know that was though it was those two who initially kind of pulled it together um and i guess because i was doing so much stuff with Vishal at the time i kind of like you know got involved with that um which i'm really glad of because it was i didn't even know it was kind of happening when it was happening and suddenly this kind of collaboration formed and um well it's been four or five years now and you know we've we've, we've published a few bits um but yeah i mean like you know, it's for me. It's the outreach for the snake bite stuff and trying to get it over to this side of the pond and telling people, you know, like this is what's happening over there. You know, it's something we should think about because you know you have rice on your evening meal. You know, where do you think that came from? And the people who who collected that are the people who are being bitten. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just that such a frequent rate. The people just don't realize how how frequent it is. And you know, I'll give a talk that might last forty five minutes to an hour. Um, and I'll say to people, like, you know, people have died during this talk. You, know, you, might, you might have 20, 30 people who are bitten whilst I gave this talk. And that's how, how high the rates are. Um, and it's just, you know, the, the people who are at the bottom of the wealth ladder are the ones affected. So obviously nobody thinks to, to change anything. Um, and it, it's, it's a very difficult thing because, you know, our argument is that we need to stop it from happening rather than focusing on the kind of the treatment of it afterwards because a lot of the times you right, can save right. the life but you're not gonna you know save the actual life of that human like what they were doing beforehand um you know they lose a limb or there's issues with lymphatic systems where you you just you don't get the same life back or you can't work anymore and then you you know you're, you're living day to day paycheck to paycheck you're, you're not gonna be able to support your your family or anything you know it was there was one case in 2000 and 17 i think and um we were speaking to bite victims in west bengal and this woman who'd been bitten by a monocled cobra years before i think maybe about five years beforehand um she kept getting these reoccurring like black patches on her palms and her feet and it wasn't necrosis even though it looked like the beginnings of it so it would go away after a while so the doctors had assumed it was because of the snake bite or something then you triggered something and She'd been to see them and they'd said, okay, you need this um, antifungal cream. So her husband was having to work like crazy. Um, I think he was driving like tuk-tuks or something so he could afford to buy it. And he was at the verge of divorcing his wife because he just kind of, he'd reached that maximum threshold for, for stress and anxiety for mm-hmm. it. And um, we were just thinking about this. We were like, the doctors don't actually know what's going on here. And they, I think they just kind of giving them anything and then having to like, so Vishal, we spoke to Vishal afterwards and he went in and told him like the guy, you've basically not needed to buy that cream. Like yeah. we think yeah. what happened, we, we spoke to David Wall um, before we said anything, just, you know, kind of confirm what we were saying, but he thinks it was like a, like a stress or like a physical induced issue, like skin issue or muscle issue that the, the, the stress of the bite caused, because obviously she, you know, she did suffer serious um, symptoms when she was bitten. But it's probably one of those things where the cream's not doing anything at all. Of course, uh, yeah. As you're saying antifungal cream, I mean, it doesn't really make yeah. any sense. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, that's like one family of thousands and you know millions globally where we shall have to go and tell them like, you've wasted your time and money. Like you really didn't need to do that. And it's just things like that really stick with you. Um, so for me, it's just like, the. I think, you know, I, I try to do what I can with the outreach work and I try to push the idea that we need to really get an, like an ecological understanding of snake bite because um, there is no money in understanding why it actually happens. So uh, one of the things we published last year was, um, so we did like a collaborative paper for the journal Toxicon. So it's like a special issue. And in our paper, we kind of had separate chapters. And I, I was looking at the time at um, uh, the funding imbalances and where the various funding is going into the studies of snake bites. So I looked at a few thousand um, grants and for clinical trials and anti-venom production and testing, you're talking millions and millions and millions of dollars. When I looked at the ecological studies, um, I think I had a total of $110,000 in the last like 10 years. And, yeah. you know, most of that was made up of one big grant. And then there was just like a few, like $500 here and there to understand what crates feed on or whatever. 
And I think it's just if we could like fix that funding imbalance, we could really start to understand why these snakes bite. So like we still don't know why crates and cobras come into people's houses and bite them in their sleep. It's it's probably a thing where they come in and they they're looking for prey and there's a warm mammal, so they, they testify it. But there's no hard evidence for that. We don't actually know that. Um, so we don't even have those those starting blocks for that kind of that research. Because the same other thing happens with cobras in Africa. Um, so I think that's just kind of some of the the key stuff that we really should know if we're even going to stop these bites from ever happening in the first place. Well, and it makes so much sense. I mean, because the cascade of issues that happen as soon as a snake, a person gets bit by a snake, there's just so many issues. I mean, there's the medical issues, there's the long-term health issues, there's all the sort of like the like you'd mentioned the antifungal creams or the the sort of the myths that go along with how to cure a snake bite. There's the envi- or the community impact. There's people are very afraid of snakes, rightly so, and so you have this whole sort of thing that unfolds after. So if you can actually prevent that from happening, it would seriously reduce all that extra legwork that has to get done once someone gets bit. I, I mean, are most people, get, I mean, with Russell's vipers, for example, I mean, I'm, I imagine most bites must be on the hands, like when they're, or, or the feet, right? When they're picking crops or. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of like the, the, you know, the, the edges of limbs and stuff, but you, that's where most of them do happen. And you kind of have these, you know, there's a lot of varieties of a snake bite, I guess, or like kind of, a couple, a couple of main groupings in which snake bite happens, and you do have that like, agricultural side where you have laborers getting bitten on the hands and limbs. With Russell vipers, it does actually happen on the neck sometimes as well because you kind of collect all the rice buns and then you throw them up. And okay, it's, um, I've heard of a few bites now of like the younger Russell vipers because they're so small they kind of just get lumbered in there and they bite people on the neck or the shoulder. But yeah, hands and feet are very common. Um, so in Himachal Pradesh, where we do. I say we've done most of our kind of work and field work now. You get the Himalayan pit vipers, the Gloidius. And there's a lot of bites to the hands because people are, you know, working in the fields and they're they're there. These are really small vipers. And um luckily there's doesn't seem to be, you know, anecdotally, it doesn't seem to be many permanent issues from those bites. And I, I don't know the death rates like, but they're low. Um, but they still put people out of work. So you've got that kind of poverty factor um but then you have the other side of snake bite where is like the snake handlers and this is a really difficult one because you offend a lot of people when you talk about it and you get people who basically handle these snakes in a crazy kind of way because it gets social media likes um so a lot of the young guys in india who are posting these on social media you know, they're kissing cobras on the head or they're free handling them or whatever because that's what gets all the views on Facebook. You know, if you you film a natural history segment on a cobra, which is actually very, very cool, it's never going to do as well as somebody who's doing crazy things with a cobra or whatever. Um, yeah. And that's a lot of the bites as well. So there's there's that kind of outreach and education you need to do. And I think a lot of people jump on those guys and, you know, they kind of shift them to the side and they kind of put them in this box of people you should never interact with and they're bad people and blah, blah, blah. And I think you really have to come down to the level and understand why they're doing this. Um, you know, because everyone everyone loves social media attention. Um, mm. So, you know, there's, and there's people we've spoken to where you just explain to them, you know, what can go wrong. And you just, some people are like, you know, I don't care, I'm doing this anyway. But some people actually get on board with what you're doing and then they actually will help you to get outreach work done or speak to locals. and. Um, kind of get on that fight, I guess, with bringing snake bite down from the base level and preventing it from happening in the first place, or at least helping people get to hospital or telling people what to do if they get bitten. Um, and that's kind of my argument with, this could go down a whole massive rabbit hole, but I have this thing with like free handlers where if you want to do it, do it. No issues whatsoever. You know, it's up to you to do whatever you want to do. But I think once you start doing it on social media and things that, you know, and with anything, not necessarily just freehanding the venomous snakes, I think there's a responsibility. Um, and I, I don't think a lot of people realize the reach they have when they do these things. Um, and then you get a lot of these people copying you who don't necessarily have any idea. You know, and I, I'm not arguing that there's a skill involved in freehandling 
venomous snakes. Mm-hmm. There really is. You, you know, you have to understand those animals. Uh, you have to be, you know, you have to know and trust yourself and have, and have those abilities. But when you are going to have people copy you um, who don't necessarily have those skills, or they don't necessarily have that understanding of those animals. You know, and you're talking sometimes these kids are like 10 to 15 years old and they've seen these Facebook videos and they're picking up cobras and trying to kiss them on the heads and stuff. And then, you know, 24 hours later, they're, you know, they're in a coma or they died or they've got permanent limb damage. Um, that's that's usually kind of the other side of snake bite, which it's a very, very difficult one because it turns to disputes and it turns to, you know, a lot of people defending their actions and whatnot. And I think they just need, I think people just need to think a little bit about kind of the role model they set or the, mm-hmm. the, the platform they set because people are going to copy. And then I've heard people say, well, it's their choice. They can do what they want and, you know, it's up to them to do it. But people are a little bit less informed or they're a little bit more naive and they see these things and they, you know, a free handler can make it look easy. They can make it look like you could do it. Um, mm-hmm. But the amount of times I've seen videos of, you know, the guys in India, they pick up a cobra by the, the front third and it just spins around and grabs them on the hand. Yeah, um, uh, yeah it's it's one of those, that's an, another very difficult side of snake bite to, to solve. But a lot of that side of it actually gets kind of, you know, you speak to some of the rescuers and whatnot and they'll kind of say, well, they brought it on themselves or wherever. And I just don't think that's very fair. I think they're not doing, you know, they're, they're not doing it because they're, bad people they're just yeah. um it's what they see other people doing um yeah it's, it's, it's what a they very see complex online. issue snake bite as a whole <laughs> what's that it's a very complex issue oh, yeah. Um, like yeah. the whole snake by as a whole it's all these kind of rabbit holes you can go down and there's things that need to be fixed on both sides yeah it is a really interesting problem especially as, as youtube and tiktok and instagram just continues to expand and grow and grow that yeah we do start to see these things and and the social media machine feeds that entertainment side so aggressively that it, it definitely is not not right. And Scott Iper has a great analogy that I'm going to forget at some point right now. Or he, <laughs> he had said on the on the show before, but talking about firearm safety and, and people who are irresponsible with firearms. And when you're in the firearms community, it's so much about safety. You know, everything is about safety. To get your firearm license, you need to go through these crazy, sa- at least in Canada, crazy sa- safety courses. And it, everything that those people do is like this ritual where they go through making sure that they, you know, someone that knows their firearm is empty and not, not, there's nothing in it, they'll still go through and look through the chamber and do all this extra activity just because it's part of the routine of safety. And that's where you see a lot of the venomous, venomous keepers as well, right? There's just so much redundancy in keeping things safe, which is really, really good. But then you have this sort of cowboy style craziness that the social media d- machine does feed. And like you said, doesn't mean they're bad people. It means that there, there's something promoting and, and, and something pushing them to do that. And, and maybe there's ways we can help them you know reduce that amount of activity online oh yeah exactly i mean like i have no doubt that you know there's a thrill and there's an enjoyment to free handling a king cobra or free handling a spectacle cobra like i'm, I'm sure there is um and it is it's of course up to those people if they want to take that risk but i think we just need to yeah i think it's just you know kind of provide that information properly so that people actually understand the risk they're taking. Because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you're 15 years old. You think you're invincible. You think you're going to get bitten by this snake. It's never going to kill you. But um, it happens a lot. Like there was, there's been cases in India where people have been bitten and they've, they've not believed anything bad's going to happen, but they've actually gone to hospital with the snake still attached to them and stuff like that. And like, it's, it's just, it's wild. Like it is really, really wild. And I think, yeah, I think people just need to maybe think a little bit about what they put out there and is it worth the social media likes and whatnot, or just, you know, at least, at least put a disclaimer or something. Just, yes, exactly. Just put some effort into actually keeping other people safe and, you know, you can still do what you want to do and I'm sure it's fun and enjoyable, but yeah, you know, I'm not going to go and jump out of a plane and not, you know, then not tell people that's a safe thing. Uh, it's, it's okay to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, without making it clear where the, the dangers are. So yeah, it's uh, like you said, it's a very complex thing that can sort of unravel forever. But it is really interesting hearing that work. And then hopefully over time, you know, we can start to reduce snake bite in that part of the world where even even the, the hands and the feet and, you know, the farming agriculture side seems like maybe the easiest place to start. And then hopefully, you know, we can figure out why people are getting bit at night and whatnot. And, and the, the last thing I wanted to, to chat with you about too is that it sounds like you also have 
a an educational side or a um, like the the Northwest. What's it called? Northwest. Um, you, oh, the reptile encounters. You, yes, yeah, reptile encounters. That's right. So, is that something else that you do on top of all this? On top of your PhD? On top yeah, of <laughs> kind of. Um, yeah. So that was more. So when I was home, I was like, cool. I, I guess I, I'm just stubborn and I didn't want to work for anybody else. So I thought I need to make some money while I'm home. Um, and I had a few friends who were doing like the reptile encounters and workshops, you know, for like a kids' party or a school or whatever. Um, so I thought I'll give it a go. You know, we've got enough animals here and stuff. It was a whole process trying to get the, like the registration with the council and stuff because they've got to sign it off and make sure you're not taking sick animals or whatever. But it's not a common thing in North Wales, so the council didn't really have a, a clue what they were doing. <laughs> I had two guys come to inspect and they were scared of snakes; they wouldn't come in the room. Perfect. Like, <laughs> but you know, they signed it off magically somehow. Um, but yeah, so I thought I'll I'll give that a go, and it kind of took off, and it was doing really well before COVID hit. Um, but I, th- I think it's one of those things where it once like the expeditions take off and they're, they're more busy, that, that kind of falls back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we, well, the insurance prices went up for like kids parties and stuff because of COVID because you're in like a private house or whatever. So after COVID, we kind of shifted it to, we just do workshops for like schools, um, and groups and things like that. Um, you know, like scouts groups or, um, like organized groups and colleges and stuff. So. Yeah, it, was the, it kind of shifted from just this, like, oh, you can come and meet our animals to our, like, outreach work, but in the UK instead. So mm-hmm. if, like, a, if you have a college book you or a school with, like, slightly older pupils, you might do an actual, like, snake bite workshop and um, teach them about it. And you can, you can bring some, like, safe-to-handle snakes at the same time just to get them interacting. Yeah, so it just kind of evolved. So we actually have incorporated that into Captain Field. So it's kind of like a, a little branch out of that, but it's like a – outreach work when we're back in the UK. Um, you know, if, if you did something for a team that's going to go out into the field for something else, we could actually teach them about first aid for like a spider, a scorpion or snake bites and things and things and, and what oh, to cool. do. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like just starting to tick over again now post COVID, but um, you know, when expeditions are really busy, that's the kind of thing that I might just do one or two here and there to kind of keep things ticking over and to, to do a bit. But um yeah you know it's, it's very difficult to organize like a snake bite workshop in the uk at a frequent rate anyway because it's, it's, it doesn't have a huge audience <laughs> yeah yeah exactly well it, that sounds amazing i absolutely loved this conversation ben and it's uh, we need more people like you in the in herpet culture <laughs> and just in general because it's just amazing how many different branches of, of things you're, you're doing and how valuable that is for keepers people who are just you know people like me who haven't had a chance to go explore in the wild and we can read the journals and read the articles and pull out a lot of information from there can you let everybody know where they can find all your information online yeah um so most of our activities on facebook at the moment so they'll just find us by typing in captive and field herpetology um we are on instagram and you'll find us i will change the handle all the time but i think at the moment it's like cnf herpetology um or if you type in captive and field herpetology you'll find us as well um we are on twitter but we're not too active there i do slack with that a little bit <laughs> um and then all of our updates are from the website which is just www.captainfieldherpetology.com um and then all the like examples of our past expeditions are on there all the journal releases are on there um so they can go through and look at full journals or download like all the individual articles um and then yeah, all the details of our upcoming upcoming trips are on there so we've got one which will be open for a little a well, little while longer, which is in July to Mizoram. So it's like the right up in the northeast of India, but it's kind of like that corridor between India and Southeast Asia. So you got all those like cool species that you don't get on the on the main Indian um, peninsula. And then yeah, we'll hopefully be doing a Morocco expedition later this year. Um, and then we'll be getting back into our Easter expeditions. So, you know, probably a European location in Easter and some more Indian stuff next year as well. Awesome. Well, that sounds all amazing. I'm, I'm sure you'll, some people, some of the listeners will, will reach out to you to be included in some of that. So thank you so much, Ben. This was an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Oh, no worries. I really enjoyed that. I'll uh, have to do it again sometime. Absolutely. Yeah. There's definitely more in the head that we'll have to, we'll have to get out. 
And that is the end of that episode. Ben, thank you so much for joining me. I really, really enjoyed that conversation. Like I said to the intro, and I think I even said to you after the podcast, that felt like a long conversation in a good way. I just can't believe how much different topics we covered there. And it just felt like we went into depth in so many different things. I can't believe that it was only an hour and a half. So that's just a testament to your knowledge and your experience. And I do really appreciate you sharing that with myself and the listeners. Listeners, I'm sure you enjoyed that podcast. So make sure you let me know and either send me a DM on Instagram or put a comment on YouTube. YouTube, or just send me an email. And if you did enjoy it, sharing it on Instagram and Facebook is really one of the best ways and the easiest ways to help support the podcast. I know many of you are doing that, so I do really appreciate that. If you're looking for more information on this podcast, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. If you'd like to join us on Patreon, you can join us on the Discord server and, and have some of the Patreon perks that comes with being a member there. You can do that at patreon.com slash animalsathome. Again, customreptilehabitats.com is the sponsor of this podcast. So if you're looking for anything reptile related, make sure you head to one of the affiliate links in either the show notes or the YouTube description. If you make a small purchase or if you make a purchase, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And I think that is it for this week. I have some amazing episodes coming up in the, in the coming weeks and into the summer, and I cannot wait to continue sharing this with you guys. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast, and I will catch you next week.